morning. As Mandy said, my name is Chris. I'm the son of Gary and Diana. I went away to school several years ago at Southern Nazarene University, and then my wife and I moved to Kansas City where I attended seminary and finished that. Uh, we're hoping to move back home this summer uh, because we're about to have a baby, and we really want to be close to grandparents to have some free babysitting. Um, <laughs> so if you could pray for us, we actually, we are trying, we've been praying for a long time that the Lord would make a way uh, for us to come home and uh, where I could uh, begin pastoring close to home. Actually, uh, we, as of just yesterday, Dr. Downs, the dis- district superintendent for our district here, he called me and uh, we will be interviewing at a church uh, Wednesday, Wednesday night, so you could pray for that. Um, however, he did apparently invite some of those board members to come hear me today, so if any of them showed up, I'm, that interview might be um, canceled. I don't, I don't know, but... Um, so I've been told that my preaching style sometimes a little unique. Um, that'll probably change as I start to preach every week. Right now, I preach about once every uh, quarter, uh, and it, I, I don't think that researching 50 or 60 hours for one sermon is really sustainable week after week. Um, but, but that's what I've been doing lately when I've been coming here, and, and so it's been fun to just share uh, what I've learned. Uh, I do recognize my style's a little different, though. And so uh, if you... If you brought a friend with you today, just lean over now and say, I'm sorry, I didn't know this guy was coming. Please don't hold this against me. But if, if you did know I was preaching and you invited them anyway, well, that's just mean. Um, but what, so here's what's going to happen today. I'm going to share a lot of information. And um, probably today, it, it's not going to make much sense until the very end. And hopefully, I'll tie it all together. And the husband just said to his wife, I think that's what he does every it makes no sense. But, uh, so I never think of creative sermon titles, but I'm proud of this one today. I, I didn't ha- think of it in time for when the bulletin was printed. So today's sermon is titled, Rabbis, Lambs, and Door Jams. Uh, so I was very proud of that. Um, you know, it's better in my, in my mind, but hopefully it'll make sense uh, what we're doing. Um, by the way, someone asked me once why I preach. Oh, bummer. My slide thing is not working. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Someone asked me why I use all these slides, and the honest answer is I l- kept losing my place when I was trying to read from my sermon notes, so I just started using this. Uh, everything I'm sharing today, it, it's not new, it's not original to me. I'm a student, I love to learn, so everything I say, and I'm in everything I say today, someone else has preached it, someone else has lectured about it, someone else has written a book about it, someone else has blogged about it, uh, so I really can't take any credit um, today. If you think this is the best sermon you've ever heard, I, I can't take credit. Um, of course, if you think this is the worst sermon you've ever heard, I, I can't take credit. But if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn to Exodus, what's the, what the, or Genesis 22. It's a little slow, I'm not sure. Is that you doing it? Oh, Ann, bummer. Okay, uh, I got about 100 slides, so poor Ann's going to have to keep going. Genesis 22, I'm going to go fast, Ann. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood. Strangely enough, he just starts following this command, which is a sermon for another day. Abraham took the word for the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. I guess if this clicker is not going to work, I won't use it. Thanks, Ann. Uh, as the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for, my bur- for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Verse 9, when they had reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now, I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only 
son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, here's the title, Rabbis, Lambs, and Door Jams. Here's where the rabbis come in. I'm going to mention the ancient rabbis several times, so you can find a lot of ancient uh, Jewish writing and commentary about the scriptures. Not in the scriptures, you have to look outside of it. But the ancient rabbis, they asked this question, never thought about it until I read it from them. They said, Abraham, if Abraham said God would provide a lamb, why did he end up sacrificing a ram? And they took the word very seriously. Abraham didn't say ram. Abraham said God would provide a lamb. And then he finds a ram. What's that about? Now, next part. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 12. Go over to the book of Exodus chapter 12. The Jewish people, they've been in, in bondage in Egypt uh, for about 400 years. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month. God is referring to the month of Nisan as it became known um, when they went in the exile, it's a Babylon, uh, Babylonian word. In uh, some of your Bibles, you may see it called the month of Abid. Same month, though, month of Nisan. This month is to be for you the first month, and the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, which would have been kind of unusual, uh, because you just had big families, uh, if any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month. So let me pause. God says, choose a lamb, take a lamb on the 10th day so you don't do anything with it until the 14th day. So then on the 14th day, at the end of the day, at twilight, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Verse 7, then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. God says, on that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and women animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. Pay attention to that word. God says, I will bring judgment not on the people of Egypt, not on Pharaoh. I will bring judgment on the gods of Egypt. We'll come back to that. I am the Lord, and the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, which is where we get the name for the Jewish festival, the Jewish holiday, Passover, when God passed over. Now, ancient rabbis, again, the ancient rabbis read this, and they said, oh, this must be the lamb that Abraham said God would provide. And so they just naturally read into it. You can find some ancient uh, Jewish rabbis in books that you'd probably never be interested in reading, but, you know, if you want to, it's called the Talmud, uh, Mishnah, some of these ancient Jewish commentaries where rabbis talked about this stuff, and they said, oh, this must be the lamb. See, the lamb didn't come when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac, a ram came then. This must be, finally, the lamb. Next slide. <clears throat> the Day of Atonement. Remember when I preached here? If you, if you were here, I preached on the Day of Atonement. And that day, it was a goat that was sacrificed. And that Day of Atonement, that goat, marked forgiveness of sins for all the people. You remember that? All the people. The Passover lamb marked salvation and freedom from slavery. So salvation and freedom from slavery. For the firstborn, uh, firstborn Hebrew in each house, that lamb provided an individual salvation because, if you think about it, every household most likely is going to have at least one firstborn, maybe two. And so there was, very, uh, there was a literal individual salvation. For every household, every faithful Hebrew household that slaughtered a lamb, it, would have, it was either that lamb that would die or the firstborn who would die. So there was an individual salvation salvation. Next slide. But the lambs also marked a communal salvation. So all throughout Egypt, the Hebrew people were slaughtering lambs during this last plague. If you've 
read through Exodus, if you watch the Ten Commandments, the Prince of Egypt movies, all these plagues happen, and Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, no matter how bad these plagues are, Pharaoh says, no, I'm not letting these Jewish slaves go until this last plague, the death of the firstborn, happened. And so these lambs being slaughtered, they're associated with this last plague. So the Passover lamb was an individual salvation if you happen to be firstborn, because when that lamb died, that mean you, meant you didn't. But also it was communal salvation, but because of this last plague and because of all these lambs dying, we can now go free. We can leave our bondage. The Passover meal, first thing to remember, or one of many, I guess, uh, was to be eaten with family. So if you notice that in Scripture, God said, celebrate and eat this Passover with your family. Another thing to remember, the lambs died at the hands of their captors in order that the Hebrews might die free. The captors, in this case, of the lambs were the Jewish people. They went out on the tenth day and, and took the lamb. See, for 400 years, the Jewish people had been slaves in Egypt, so when any of them had died for all of these generations, they weren't dying as free people. They were dying in captivity, in slavery. And so now, in this strange, amazing reversal, the lamb dies in captivity. Therefore, the Jewish people no longer, forever, have to die in captivity. But not everyone survived that night. There were many Many who did die, many firstborn, and you could say they died because of sin. Well, one sin was that they enslaved a group of people, and they never should have done that. Another sin was that Moses, speaking on behalf of God, kept warning the people, saying, if, if you don't let us go, God will send this plague, and they don't listen. And he said, if you don't let us go, well, God will send this plague, and they still don't listen. And this happened time after time, not believing that God is a man of of his word. So you could say that the firstborn who did die in Egypt, well, they died, died because of sin. Now, verse, uh, verse 14 in Exodus chapter 12, God, he's given these instructions to the people, and he goes on, he says, this is the day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. And, and uh, for the most part, the Jews were pretty good about keeping this Passover celebration every single year. But after the first Passover, they were no longer slaves in Egypt. So the Egyptian, or the being in Egypt, took on this like metaphorical theme to it, especially the first Jewish Christians who wrote our New Testament. You start to see this language of, yes, it was a miracle that God literally took us out of slavery in Egypt, but God is also doing something constantly like that all the time when he takes us out of our bondage to sin. So throughout scripture, especially in the New Testament, you see Egypt become this motif, this metaphor of us or the opportunity we have to leave our bondage to sin. Egypt is like the sin and we can leave that and God can set us free. Ancient rabbis, once again, they ask a pretty good question. They say, why did the people have to take the lambs on the 10th if they wouldn't kill them until the 14th? Why not take the lambs on the 13th? Or why not take the lambs the morning of the 14th to slaughter them in the evening? That's kind of a strange thing. Well, they, the rabbi said, well, maybe at least part of the answer is in God's command. He says, he describes the type of lamb the people were to pick. They were to pick lambs without defect. And some of the rabbis said, well, maybe they had to keep these lambs several days because maybe there's some types of imperfections, impurities that you wouldn't be able to see when you immediately grab a lamb. But if you take care of it for several days, you might start to realize, wait a minute, something's not right with this lamb. There's something, there's something impure, there's something, there's sickness, there's disease, there's something. So they said, maybe that was part of it. Uh, another example they gave um, starts getting a little more out there. Um, the Jewish rabbis started uh, to write what are called midrash. You can read these midrash today. Uh, they're weird to our Western minds because we would read this information and say, that didn't happen, that wasn't in the Bible, you're just making stories up. But these Jewish rabbis, to fill in the gaps and answer the questions that the Bible sometimes doesn't answer. You ever read the Bible and think, well, why did the Bible answer this question? question that clearly we're all having, or, or what happened between this day and that day, and the Bible doesn't bother 
to answer. And so these Jewish rabbis, they would write midrash, kind of historical fiction. The average Jew would not appreciate that term, but we would look at that and say, well, that's just kind of a made-up story. Um, but the Jewish rabbis, I mean, they were kind of like preachers. You never knew when they were telling the truth, you know. Um, so they would, they would write these mad midrash, and one of the midrash that they said, one of these ex possible explanations for what was happening, why they took the, the lambs on the tents, and what happened to the lambs during those days, was this. Um, by the way, that reference at the bottom, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, but that's the midrash where I found it, if you're really interested to learn more. One explanation for what happened these several days was that they took the lambs on the tent and they tied them to the bedposts in their houses. And the bedpost being the, the closest, um, most intimate part of their home where they could watch and they could examine these lambs every day to make sure that they were pure. Another midrash said, no, I don't think they tied them to the bedpost. Said they placed them at their doorsteps and tied them to their doorposts. And there's this quote that says, it, meaning the lamb, being alive would cry out and the Egyptians would see their gods caught. Remember that part of the verse in Exodus? Said God would bring judgment on, not, not Pharaoh, not the Egyptians, but the gods of Egypt. One of the gods worshipped in ancient Egypt was a ram. A ram is an adult male lamb. Here's a statue, a giant statue in Egypt today. That was the ram god. And below the ram is one of the pharaohs. And it was this symbolic way of saying that the ram god whom we worship is protecting our pharaoh and therefore protecting all of Egypt. So some of these rabbis, they said, well, they tied them to the doorpost so all the Egyptians could see these lambs and would learn that these lambs who the Egyptians worshipped were going to be slaughtered in a few days. Others said, well, well, what happened when they took the lambs was that they took these lambs, not paraded, it's probably too strong of a word, but in broad daylight for all the Egyptians to see, these Jewish rabbis said, they, they kind of paraded these lambs through the streets of Egypt, and it would provide opportunity for Egyptians to say, what are you doing with that lamb? And they would say, oh, we're going to kill it in a few days. So, so really, re I want you to remember this one. So now, you don't have to worry about whether or not it really happened, but I'm saying an ancient Jew, they just would have read these midrash, these stories, and when they remembered the first Passover, when ancient Jews, like around the time Jesus was alive, when they were remembering that first Passover, because they had a culture that listened to these midrash, they remembered with these details in mind. So an ancient Jew remembering, hearing the story of the first Passover, their mental picture includes things like tying a lamb to a bedpost or to a doorpost. Their mental picture includes this image that they're imagining of lambs being paraded through the streets of Egypt in broad daylight for all the people to see. Now remember the Passover celebration, it continued year after year, and when the temple was built, the priests, um, or people brought the lambs to the priests. So the first Passover, just the man of the household slaughtered the priest, or slaughtered the lamb. When the temple, <laughs> slaughtered the priest, ah, that's not good. Um, when the temple was built, the people, they, would, they wouldn't slaughter the lamb and put uh, blood on the doorpost anymore, but they would slaughter it and eat it for their Passover meal. And they made sure that they were bringing a perfect lamb to the priest, but then the priest himself also would examine this lamb to make sure there were no impurities. So by the time of Jesus, because he was alive when the temple was built, the lamb really had a double examination each year. They were examined first, then the people would select the lamb and examine for impurities, and then they were examined again by the priests in the temple. Also, another tradition that started getting tired yet, all this information. Another tradition that started was the people, when they would bring the lambs to the temple to be slaughtered the night of Passover, they would sing what they called the Hallel, which is a group of six psalms, uh, Psalms 113 through 118. And they would literally, they would just sing them as they're processing to the temple, and then they got in the temple, and then the priests would sing them. So you want to remember that part of the Passover celebration is singing Psalms 113 all the way through Psalm 118. And there again, if you want to look it up, that's the reference. Whew. That's a lot of information. You need a break? Stretch? No? Okay, let's keep going. We're going to talk about a different lamb in a second, but let me recap. On the 10th day of the month, God says, take a lamb. 
And the Jewish people believed these lambs were led through the streets in broad daylight for all the Egyptians to see. And then the lamb was kept at the home and examined until Passover to make sure there was nothing wrong with the lamb. Remember that the firstborn in Egypt who did die, they died because of sin. Remember that Psalms 113 through 118, by the time of Jesus, we know for a fact, based on extra-biblical Jewish history, that Psalm 113 through Psalm 118 were sung every time Passover happened. And remember that Egypt became a metaphor for sin, another type of lamb. Also in Exodus, Exodus chapter 29, 38 through 42, God gives these instructions about another lamb, a different lamb for a different purpose. This is what you are to offer on the altar. That's the altar at the tabernacle, where later it was the temple. This is what you are to offer on the altar regularly each day, two lambs a year old. Offer one in the morning and the other at twilight. Two lambs every day, one in the morning, one at twilight. Verse 40, with the first lamb, offer a tenth of an ephah, that's a an ancient measurement that doesn't really translate today, but offer a tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with another quarter of a hin of oil, that's another measurement, uh, from pressed olives, so fine flour and olive oil, and a quarter of a hin of wine as a drink offering. So God says, two lambs sacrificed every day, one in the morning, one in the evening, and when you sacrifice them, sacrifice them with flour, olive oil, and wine, Verse 41, sacrifice the other lamb at twilight with the same grain offering and its same drink offering as in the morning. And this will be a pleasing aroma, an offering made to the Lord by fire. So men, when you tell your wives that you're going to go out to barbecue, say, honey, I'm just, I'm bringing up a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Because God said he loves the smell of, apparently, of lamb roasting on the fire. But verse 42 for the generations to come, remember this is supposed to happen every day for generations to come, the burnt offering is to be made regu regularly at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. Now, another bit of historical information that uh, it can be found outside of the Bible. You know, we all have these traditions, and as things progress, we sometimes we add true traditions and do our own thing. A tradition that we know that it's not found in scripture, but it's found in Jewish history, is that every single time, twice a day, every day, when these sacrifices happened, a priest trained in trumpeting would blow from a trumpet, or in Hebrew, a shofar, a ram's horn. I tried to blow this thing. This is really tough. It, it, it's tough to do. Let's try it. And so, it's pretty loud, right? Yeah, I didn't know I was going to do that. Uh, so, every day, twice a day, the priest, trained in trumpeting, would blow a trumpet, a shofar, to announce to all the people within earshot of Jerusalem a sacred sacrifice is about to happen. It's kind of similar if you've seen Middle Eastern news coverage and those minarets, and there's a call to prayer to remind Muslims that we're about to pray. So remember, this happened... Uh, every day, before each sacrifice, to tell all the people something sacred is about to happen. We know from the ancient Jewish historian Josephus that these daily sacrifices, uh, God just says do them in the morning and the evening, it didn't specify a time. So the Jews, they did, and they chose the sacrificial times as the ninth hour and, or the third hour and the ninth hour, which in our clock system would be 9 a.m., and 3 p.m. The Jews, ancient Jews, use a clock system. It was a 12-hour day from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., and that was their day. And then 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. was night. So the third hour in their system would be 9 a.m. The ninth hour would be 3 p.m. We'll come back to that. You may already know where I'm going. So remember, with this lamb, different from the Passover lamb, the sacrificial lamb, remember these things. Two lambs were sacrificed every day, with flour, olive oil, and wine. The first sacrifice we learn from ancient historians like Josephus happened at 9 a.m. The second happened at the ninth hour at 3 p.m. We know from history as well that trumpets were blown before each sacrifice every time, twice a day, to tell all the people something sacred is about to happen. Listen up, pause, reflect, 
worship. A lamb is about to die for you. Now, putting this all together, are you asking yourself, what on earth does this mean? Uh, so, we're going to slowly start putting this together by reading some scripture in the New Testament. Six days before the Passover, says John chapter 12, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor, and these dinners normally happened in the evening. And so you'd have the evening, and then you'd have the next day. So, John chapter 12 says, Jesus arrived in Bethany six days before the Passover, which happened when? The evening of the... Anyone? Call it out. 14th. I think I heard someone. So it happened the evening of the 14th. So the full day of Passover was counted as like its own day. The Passover didn't happen until the very end of the day. So the next day, that would be now five days before Passover, if you count Passover as its own day, the day before you actually sacrifice the lamb. The next day, a great crowd that had come for the feast, that's Passover, and the next feast after it, unleavened bread, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Now let me stop there. In the entire Old Testament, which is all, when Jesus was alive, the the New Testament hadn't yet been written, so their Bible was nothing more than the Old Testament. In the entire Old Testament, the word Hosanna happens one time in Psalm 118, the last of the six psalms of the Hallel, which were sang every year as the people process up, bringing their, their Passover lamb. And these people shout and chant, from Psalm 118. Hosanna, blessed is the name, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a donkey, a young donkey, and sat upon it, as it is written in another place. Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. <clears throat> now, here's a calendar. I wanted to put this up to help you keep track of the days. This is the month of March we're in right now. Last Sunday was the 10th. Uh, just a couple days ago, Thursday was the 14th, and that was just a couple days ago. We know from Scripture, Passover was always to happen on the 14th at the very end of the day, in the evening. We know from Scripture, Jesus died the day after Passover. Remember, the Last Supper, the, the disciples say to Jesus, where should we go to prepare the Passover? And Jesus eats this Passover meal with his disciples. Then he's taken off, and the next day, He's killed, and they're in a hurry to get him in the ground before Sabbath begins at 6 p.m. Friday night. So we know, oh, back up for a second again, sorry. So we know that Jesus died on the 15th. We know the day before that was the 14th. So, count back, that means the 10th of Nisan, the month Jesus died, the 10th was a Sunday. Now, we know before Palm Sunday, Bethany if you count Passover as its entire own day, well, that means when John, Gospel of John says Jesus arrived at Bethany six days before the Passover, well, that means he arrived at Bethany on Saturday. He stayed the night. He had dinner there. The next day, he had uh, the Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, as we say. And then he spent several days in the temple teaching, interacting, with people. So does that make sense how it's all working? So Palm Sunday was the 10th. Hope, that, hope you're following that there. The 10th, remember, was the same day God says, take a lamb and keep it until the 14th. Okay, and we can continue. So then Jesus was examined. He has Palm Sunday on the 10th, lamb selection day, and he was examined by the people. He goes into the temple, and it says, now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Verse 34, a little later, Jesus is teaching, and he kind of gets in an argument with the people, and they start questioning him. The crowd spoke up. We have heard that the law, from the law, that the Christ will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And then Jesus' final examination happened just hours before he died. John 18 says, Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. 
that year. And Caiaphas, again, meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Now, what does the Passover lamb have to do with the sacrificial lamb? Why did I even bother sharing them in the same sermon? Well, Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verse 25, says it was the third hour, 9 a.m. Do you remember the third hour when the sacrificial lamb was first uh, was slaughtered each day? It was the third hour, 9 a.m., when they crucified him, meaning when they put the nails into him and raised him on a cross. So at the same time, a trumpet is being blown and a lamb is dying in the temple. A man on a hill is being nailed to a cross. Mark 15, at the sixth hour, which would be noon by our clock, at the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, remember the ninth hour, 3 p.m., when a lamb is being sacrificed and slaughtered in the temple? At the ninth hour, Jesus is still alive, and he cries out in a loud, a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is Aramaic, which is for my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So what does this all mean? Well, it means the Passover lamb, Jesus is our Passover lamb. It means Jesus is our sacrificial lamb. And in these final days of his life, he's saying, I'm the lamb you're looking for. Pick me. It means Abraham's prophecy about God providing a lamb was finally fulfilled in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he says, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. 1 Peter 1, 19 says, You were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. On the same day, the 10th, on the same day, the first Passover lambs were chosen in Egypt. Next slide. Jesus was chosen by a crowd in Jerusalem who hailed him as the one who would bring salvation. Just as the Passover lambs went through the streets in Egypt, the Lamb of God went through the streets in Jerusalem. I love this. It's amazing. As he went through the streets, people shouted words from the Hallel, Psalms 113 through 118, and they would chant the same psalms only days later as they brought their Passover lamb to the temple. The first Passover meal, remember, was eaten with immediate family members, your immediate family members. But Jesus, he made a new family. Matthew 12, 50 says, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. And so Jesus eats his Passover meal with the new family, the family of God. And just as the Passover lambs were examined in the Hebrews' houses and then by the priests each year after that, Jesus was examined by the people and the priests in the temple, the house of God. Jesus, just as the Jews believed those lambs were tied to doorposts and cried out for all the Egyptians to hear, Jesus was tied to a post while being whipped and cried out in agony before his death. Just as the blood from the first Passover lambs was smeared on a wooden doorframe, the blood from the final Passover lamb was smeared on a wooden cross. The Passover lambs died in the place of the Hebrew firstborn and marked the Hebrews' deliverance from slavery. Christ, whom the Apostle Paul says is the firstborn of all creation, died for us to free us from our slavery to sin. In Egypt, God brought death on the Egyptians' firstborn sons because of their sin. And in this amazing reversal in the Gospels, we read how God brought death on his own firstborn son because of our sin. In Exodus, God told Moses to sacrifice two lambs each day and mix those sacrifices with flour, oil, and wine. In the Last Supper, Jesus gave the disciples bread, which is a mixture of flour and oil and wine, and he said, this is my body and my blood. I'm the flour and oil and wine. In Exodus, God said to sacrifice two lambs each day. Remember, the trumpet blew, and the first one happened at the third hour, 9 a.m. In the Gospels, we read Jesus' crucifixion began at that very same hour. In Exodus, God said to sacrifice a second lamb each day. The trumpet blew, and it happened at the ninth hour. In the Gospels, we read Jesus hung on the cross at the ninth hour. And, 
and at a distance, in a distance, maybe if the wind was calm, maybe you could even hear it being blown. In the distance, in the city gates, in the temple, a priest blew a horn, announcing to all within earshot, pay attention, stop for a second, pause, reflect, something sacred is about to happen. And so at the ninth hour, a priest blows a horn to announce the death is about to happen, and in the Gospels, we read, it's finished. At the same time, a priest blows a horn and said, the lamb's about to die, we read, the ninth hour happened, Jesus exclaims, it's finished. And he gave up, bowed his head, and gave up his spirit. I love sermons like that and information like that because it's so historical and I love all the details. But let's face it, it's interesting trivia if it doesn't mean anything to us today. What on earth does a bunch of people living as slaves in Egypt thousands of years ago have to do? What does that have to do with us? What does some lamb, two lambs, dying every day, what does that have to do with us? Well, remember what I said that after the first exodus, after the exodus happened, remember that especially the New Testament writers, they start talking about Egypt as this metaphor and saying just as God literally brought a people out of physical, literal bondage from Egypt, God can do that for you. The New Testament writers, they constantly start talking about sin as this bondage that you cannot, you cannot break free of it on your own. See, that's what bondage is. That's what slavery is. Being enslaved to something means you want to break free, but you don't have the power. And even if you ever try to break free, you won't get far, and it'll bring you back. That's what bondage is. Unfortunately, in the church, we don't talk about bondage much unless we're talking about someone with some sort of severe addiction, alcoholism or, or drug addiction. But you know what? Bondage is anything that you want to get out of, but you can't. So you could be in bondage to your own worry and fear because no matter how much you try, you just can't stop worrying. Or no matter how much you try, you just can't stop being so obsessed with what people think about you and, and the clothes you wear and, and your future or no matter how much you think you, you want to try to get out of it, you, you, just, you just can't. You just can't. That's what bondage is. Bondage is, is anything that in our own willpower we know we want to be out of. We know we should be out of it. We know we should be free. But we can't because Scripture makes clear you don't have the power. That's why you can't. But God can. So if God can bring a group of people out of bondage, physical bondage in Egypt. He can bring you out of bondage. Maybe you are out of bondage, but your heart is heavy because you know people who are not. You know people who have not experienced freedom. And your heart's heavy for them. If God can bring out those people from bondage, he can bring out your loved ones from the bondage of sin that they have. And God sets up this other ritual twice a day, every day. Kill a lamb, mix it with flour, oil, wine, and remember God's forgiveness. Remember when you hear the trumpet blow twice a day, every day. Remember God is a God of of forgiveness. So, as usual, I, I've asked Mandy to reserve a few songs for the end, because I, I just, I don't know what it is. I really hate when any sermon I preach to be the last word. I want, I want a, a response from us to be the last word. You know, so today as we sing, 
Some of you, as you sing, remember, remember how you've been set free. Maybe you were set free years ago. Maybe you've been a Christian for years and years. Remember how God sets the prisoner free. As we sing and, and pray through song, um, some of you maybe you need to remember, or you will remember, those whom you love who are still in bondage. Uh, so we're going to pray through song. Um, but just like I said last time, uh, there's nothing mag magical about these altars up front. Um, God hears your prayers no matter where you are. Um, but sometimes we need to physically respond maybe by kneeling before the God who breaks chains. So we're going to pray through song and then Mandy will dismiss us. Um, but the altar will be open if you want to pray here or you can pray at your seats. Um, I'll be up here and if, if you'd like to pray with someone, come find me or um, one of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's sing.